Okay, so I try to be cool, but I don't think I can do it. <laughs> I know it's good. I, okay. Can I? Okay. Our second speaker is your boy Hanoi. <laughs> yeah. Practice the lot uh, in the classroom. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Hanoi is a award winning culture technologist, AI research scientist, and a composer. Uh, I will just cite uh, just a few, a couple of his achievements here because of the time limited, limitation. Uh, his achievement includes the co invention of the open source um, differenti differentiable digital signal processing, DD um, SP uh, library at Google Brain, which was mentioned several times yesterday. Uh, during Anna's uh, lecture and tone transfer and also he has won international claim for I love this one a uh, video a uh, modular figure <coughs> system uh, uh, designed for cross-cultural fluidity in tra traditional bound instruments he is also uh, the winner of the 2022 AI song contest I think we heard a bit of his um, song enter demons and gods yesterday which we mentioned melodies and tuning system from Southeast Asia using the power of modern audio uh, machine learning. So his innovations are truly at the um, uh, uh, confluence of uh, technical, artistic, and cultural dimensions, and he's bridging and balancing between the modern and the traditional, and respecting and challenging Southeast and uh, Southeast Asian culture to synthesis of not only music and technology, but also dance and design. So uh, please welcome the boy Hanoi. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, you, for the kind introduction and uh, the organizers uh, for putting this event together and inviting me here to uh, talk in front of you here in Hong Kong. Um, so yeah, hello. Uh, I'm from Bangkok, Thailand, so we would say Swati Kha. And um, I go by Ya Boy Hanoi. That's my you know artist name moniker, but my nickname is, is just Hanoi. That's what my parents called me. Uh, my dad proposed to my mom in the city of Hanoi, so they decided to nickname me Hanoi. And I decided to make a cooler version of that for my music, which is Ya Boy uh, Hanoi. So today I want to be talking about transcultural machine learning uh, for music and how we can think about machine learning in a way that empowers cultures from all around the world. And I want to focus in particular on the subject of uh, music. And uh, just a reminder that the opinions expressed in this presentation are completely uh, my own. Uh, so I sort of work in the intersection of these three dimensions. Um, I have a formal background in music composition. Um, and I also have a formal background in physics and machine learning and have been doing AI research in industry for nearly six years now. And I also like to think of myself as a cultural technologist, which is a play on the word creative technologist. So creative technologists think about how you can use technology to empower creativity. I like to think about how we can use technology to empower culture, hence the word cultural technologist. And these three things really came together um, during the 2022 AI Song Contest, because I, I, when I entered this competition, I really wanted this piece of music that I wrote to be a manifesto of how these three dimensions um, came together. And for those of you who are new today and weren't here yesterday, the AI Song Competition is an international song competition that happens every year. There are an expert panel of judges, you know, composed of Grammy-winning artists, uh, the heads of labels such as Warner and Universal and Sony, in addition to experts in music AI that give points according to a very strict rubric of uh, criteria. And there's also an international vote too, where people cast their votes on the song. And it's the combination of these two aspects combined together um, that rank uh, uh, the song. And it was, it was an incredible like, journey and experience to, to, to win this particular competition. And so I wanted to break down a little bit more about uh, how the song was put together and sort of what was going through my mind and how, for me, this represents sort of a new way of thinking of machine learning in terms of cultural empowerment. So to kick things off, I'm gonna play you a little snippet and a little live set of uh, that track.
so that is the sonic space of the song Asura Te Wat Tum Nom, or in, in English, uh, Enter Demons and Gods. And what makes this song special is the use of machine learning to analyze and make sure that the entire synthesis process, where I'm generating sounds and melodies, adhere to this particular instrument from Thailand, which is the B9. So the B is a really important instrument in Thai culture, and it's an instrument that has a very, very distinct uh, timbre to it. Um, let's hear a little bit more of what that instrument sounds like uh, when it's played solo. This is played by Ajahn Joey, who's one of my close collaborators uh, back in Bangkok. So as you can hear, the B has a very, very specific tuning system and has a very, very specific set of scales that is very unique to Thai music and is what gives Thai music that distinctive sound. The B is also a very important part of Thai culture. Um, if you, how many of you have been to Thailand? Like show of hands. All right, cool. Quite a few of you have been to Thailand. If uh, you've ever been to a boxing match, a Muay Thai game in Thailand, which is you know a, a really fun thing to do, you should do it next time you're back in Bangkok, um, I want you to pay attention to what you hear in the background. So let's look at a, a Muay Thai uh, game together, but pay attention to what you hear in the background. <laughs> So you can hear that the B is the instrument that's like the main instrument that's like hyping up the crowd. It's the main instrument that's like hyping up the, the, the boxer. So the B instrument is a very, very important part of, of not just Thai music, but sort of culture and martial arts and you know, dance. Then the, the problem that I that I faced as, as a machine learning researcher is that when I when I try to apply all these really exciting advancements in AI to this particular instrument, there really is no way of doing that because you can't take the notes that you just heard in that boxing match and what Ajahn Joey just played and write it on the keys of, of a piano. So then there's no way to encode this information, for example, like into MIDI. And if you can't encode this information, then there is no way for the, a machine learning model to understand Thai music. There's simply no way for me to feed this really important part of Thai sonic culture into the machine learning models um, that are being developed. And so the main essence of the presentation, if there's anything that you take away uh, from the talk today, is that I, I believe that technology is always created within the cultural scope of its inventors. Technology is, is never neutral. And it's some of these tensions that you saw right there where you have an instrument from Thailand in a completely different tuning system that cannot be encoded using Western scale systems. And once you can't do that, then it completely disconnects the culture uh, from the technology that's being developed. And so um, one, of the, one of the problems that I found was that if you have a machine learning model that's really great for you know, music from Beethoven or the Beatles or, or Bieber, uh, it was really hard to, to apply this to, to music that I was hearing back home and the music that, that, I, that I grew up with. And so this comes in a variety of uh, dimensions. You have things such as model bias, uh, how the machine learning model was designed, how the inputs and outputs were designed. It also comes in the form of data set. If you feed a machine learning model only music of psychedelic rock, it will generate really great psychedelic rock, but you won't be able to have it, you know, uh, generate music from Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, from different parts of the Middle East, from East Asia. And I think another important one is also benchmarking bias too. When we define if we have actually created something creative, like a creative AI model, or we have a system that can write music or can produce art, very often these benchmarks are also biased to a particular uh, form of music and a particular uh, form of art. And so these biases that you see are sort of very much in the direction of the cultural majority versus the cultural uh, minority. And I, I like to frame our discussion in terms of the cultural majority and the cultural minority 
over trying to use the words like Eastern or Western or Western and non-Western, because I think that the cultural majority and the cultural minority are things that are changing very, very fast, and especially in the world of technology. A good example of this is, for example, ChatGPT and the rise of many different similar systems that come from different countries. So you have Europe trying to develop their own version of this technology. You have Japan, you have Vietnam uh, developing their own variants of, of this particular um, kind of AI system. And you can imagine that as a, for example, a Thai person in Southeast Asia, you have these systems that work very well for Japanese, you have these systems that work very well for Chinese, and you have these systems well, that work very well for European cultures and, and North American cultures. So the cultural majority is, is, is changing very rapidly. But as a Thai person, has anything really changed for Thai uh, culture? Not really, because we're still in the cultural minority. Is there still really isn't a way for me to connect these systems um, to the ones that are being developed in the cultural uh, majority. So one of my goals and one of the things I'm really passionate about is figuring out ways to cross this boundary and to ensure that the systems that we're designing at all levels, from a very, very technical level down at the code and systems level, all the way to the design and how it's distributed and how people interact with it, they're designed in a way that uh, transcends uh, these, these, uh, the cultural majority and the cultural minority. And so if you've ever played with some of these uh, fun experiences, Morph, Tone Transfer, Sounds of India, these are some of the sort of the early works that I did looking at how we could design machine learning in a way um, that works for sounds and, and melodies from the cultural majority and the cultural minority. It was based on a, a tech called a DDSP, Differentiable Digital Signal Processing, which I had um, the immense pleasure of working with some incredible uh, colleagues uh, to put this together. It's an open source library. I'm not going to focus on the technical details in this presentation because I want to focus on how we can use this to empower melodies and sounds um, from cultures like that of Southeast Asia. So what you're going to hear is how I analyze and how I recontextualize and reimagine the sound of the bee using technologies based uh, from DDSP. So this is a very like a, a very classic passage from the beat. You can hear a lot of things going on. There's a very unique trill that occurs at the start, the way that the instrumentalist holds the vibrato at the end, and even the notes that he's hitting are all very specific notes that uh, are unique to the scale that you find on the um, on the beat. I want to emphasize that it's not just the tuning system that's important. Um, it's how the musician is assembling the notes on that scale and how all of these things interact with each other. Um, very often it can be easy to just say, well, you have the tuning system, that's all you need. That would be the same thing as saying, well, you have a B-flat major scale, you have all you need to be Beethoven and you have all you need to like write jazz. It's not about the tuning system, it's how you operate in that tuning system. So I wanted to emphasize here that it's not just about the, uh, the, 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 the notes that are on the instrument, but it's about how the instrumentalist uses all these extended techniques and the relationship between those notes, the melodies that are found in that tuning system that make Thai music sound like that. How do we approach this and sort of keep all these very unique characteristics that make the bee sound like the bee? Oh, sorry. Listen to that again. AI tools like Morph can re-render the precise pitch information from the B9 into the sound of other instruments. All right, so this was super exciting for me because the cultural impact of being able to do this is, is, is massive because now you can take sounds in the way that they're supposed to be played and heard um, in Thai culture, but you can massively expand the sonic possibilities of what, this, what, this, uh, what these melodies can do. Um, and it was an opportunity for me to basically reimagine the sounds and the timbres of these uh, melodies that were being played on, on the beat. 
And what was really exciting is that uh, what this means is that you, you no longer have to retune all, uh, Southeast Asian instruments in order to make like new modern music. Very often when you try to take, I, I, I'm sure many of you probably have ran into this uh, scenario where you want to take an instrument from your own culture that has a specific tuning system, you want to play it with like, I don't know, a piano or a guitar. And very often what happens in, in Thailand and in Southeast Asia is we retune the B so that it has the same tuning system as the piano and we lose all these relationships between uh, the, you know, that very beautiful passage that you heard in order to be able to play alongside like uh, a piano or a guitar. But here we are able to use machine learning and technology to completely reverse this relationship. Now we can have the B maintain its own fundamental like character in its tuning system and its melody but we use the technology to build around that and we use the technology to adapt to the sounds and the motifs that are found on the B instrument. And I, I think this was the main sort of shift um, that happened while I was uh, working on this piece. And as I showed you, uh, all this technology actually runs in real time, which opens up a lot of possibilities uh, for live performance and actually bringing this technology on stage um, where it belongs. Cool. So uh, I use the word transcultural a lot, and uh, I like to think of transcultural as uh, a way of designing um, and engineering a piece of technology so that it empowers cultural pluralism at every phase uh, of the process. I'm just going to check on time. I think we're still good. Um, and I think this, this is the whether a piece of technology is, is transcultural and whether it empowers different culture is, I think, very important in the context of our conversation on music and technology, because whether the music is good depend highly upon uh, cultural expectations and norms. And also, in a world of chat GPT and large language models that have now, you know, will increasingly become uh, normal in our everyday lives, I pose the question to you all, is English text really enough to describe music from all cultures? I'm sure you have come across situations where there is a word in Cantonese or in Mandarin or in your home language that you're trying to explain to your colleagues in a different language, but you simply can't do it because that word does not exist in that culture. That emotion, that, I don't know, awkwardness of that, that word described doesn't exist in uh, the target language. In the case of a completely text-based system, that means that if you can't express it in English, then there's simply no way for you to input this. We now return back to you know, the, the piano that I showed earlier, is how do you express these very culturally specific ideas to these machine learning systems? I give the example here, uh, this is uh, what's called in Thai Lai Gano, which is kind of like a concept that defines all of Thai like design. If you go to Thailand and if you pay attention to um, all of our like logos and things like that, you're going to see this design pop up everywhere. It's a very, very unique uh, aspect of uh, Thai um, visual design, but there's not an English word for this. And so this is really important to think about this because not only do we have systems like ChatGPT and DALI, but systems that transform your text into music will also become very, very commonplace. So this is a really exciting new product uh, called Stable Audio, made by the folks at Stable Diffusion, who you might know. Um, I want to play to you like an a really awesome example of what it can do uh, in the genre, for example, of rock. Uh, let's have a listen. So this is taking the text and directly rendering like the audio file. Inside of ChatGPT, and it, you know you can generate an image and you can generate music. But um, now let's look at it from the lens of some of the themes that I just talked about uh, before. And now let's prompt it for Chinese opera, and you know a vivid landscape. And I also want to hear like the sound of the guzheng in the background. Alright, 
so, so you get the idea. By the way, I'm not, I'm not trying to bash cable audio at all because uh, I have a lot of really incredible friends in the industry who work there. Um, but uh, I think what I'm trying to highlight here is that it, some of the same questions that I was facing when I was writing the Enter Demons and God songs are, are the same problems that also exist in many of these uh, state-of-the-art systems that you know we will be interacting with now and, and in the future. Uh, I even tried uh, just trying to describe the the music that I work on and also pass it into the machine learning system, uh, the, the, this system, and see what it comes up with. <laughs> Um, so I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip a couple of these slides. Um, so the, the question that I want to ask uh, all of you, and you know, as as the conference progresses, and you know, when we're having uh, tea and coffee, is is seeing all of these uh, differences in how machine learning operates across different cultures. I, I an important question is how do we develop generative AI for the Asia Pacific and beyond? And I mentioned this yesterday in the panel. Um, what's the point in powering music from our cultures with AI if, if no one wants to listen to it? And so to end this presentation, um, I wanted to share with you some of the newer works that I've been doing since uh, winning the AI Song Contest in 2022. I've had the immense privilege of working with a lot of uh, renowned Thai artists in different domains from visual arts to sculpture to dance, uh, exploring how music uh, that is rooted in Thai classical traditions, but you know, completely reimagined with machine learning um, can change the way that uh, Thai culture, you know, is created. Um, so this is one for the Bangkok Art Scene where I took some of the same techniques, but I used it to analyze and synthesize bird sounds from Thailand, bird song uh, from across Bangkok. The sounds that you hear here are all synthesized. These are, these are not actual real birds. Uh, this whole entire soundscape is completely synthesized using a variety of techniques, including some of the ones that I showed you from before. Um, this is a project that I did with Saranyan Banya, who is a, a really incredible uh, designer, um, and we worked together to put together this interactive uh, ex exhibition called the Thai Factory Room, when Parti came to give uh, an exhibition in Thailand. Again, the soundscape that you hear here is an extension of many of the techniques that I covered uh, And then uh, I've been working uh, with a choreographer called Pichai Kwan Chun, who reimagines Thai classical dance uh, in modern and contemporary um, dance. And uh, there's, a, there's actually a performance that's actually premiering like literally in a week uh, in, in Taipei, Taiwan. And um, Pichai was really excited to hear the Enter Demons and God song and actually commissioned me to write an entire one hour um, uh, performance piece uh, extending that idea uh, and he has you know put together an incredible team of dancers and actually developed a whole choreography uh, based on these based on um, reimagining Thai dance through AI and also reimagining Thai music um, through AI I've been working on this for like a full year to write like uh, one hour of music but it's been an incredible experience to take that initial idea that you saw from two years ago uh, in the Enter Demons and God song, but really develop it into a full one hour performance, but also do it in a way that combines it with uh, other dimensions, in this case, classical uh, Thai dance. So if you happen to be in Taipei, uh, please go check out uh, Cyber Sabin. Unfortunately, I can't show you uh, images uh, or, or video of, of, of the, of the, uh, the dance, because um, it hasn't premiered, but I can play you a little one minute snippet of what the music um, sounds like, and then we'll move on to Q&A.
So thank you very much, and uh, you can find me on all forms of uh, social media. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to take questions from the audience. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Hanoi. Thank you for addressing uh, the issue of diversity at the global time in such a creative way. Uh, shall we invite comment and questions? Thank you for this uh, um, very interesting presentation, which I enjoyed as much as I enjoyed the music. Um, <clears throat> so um, um, I was uh, thinking about uh, how uh, the technology, uh, especially the machine learning technology, is uh, well. While it appears uh, um, tied to a specific culture. It is on a deeper level very much culture agnostic. Well, uh, as you know much better than me, ChatGPT um, um, uh, does not work with English words, but with numbers that represent tokens, uh, which are sometimes not even words. Uh, and um, so these numerical representations of music, of text, are not. Uh, they, uh, because of training, they are connected to a specific culture, but technologically, on a deeper level, they are not. But this, this was some, uh, some um, internal uh, friction that, that mm. came to mind uh, while listening to it. And uh, well, the second um, thing that came to my mind is that uh, uh, you've been talking about empowering uh, culture. Um, but uh, is culture a thing that you can just simply empower? Is it, uh, uh, what, uh, can you know what you want to do to uh, make a culture work better? Do you, do you know how to judge? Is it working better or not? Uh, do you know, and do you have a metric mm. for a culture to, to measure the way you empower it or disempower it? Uh, it's, um, it's all, I, I think, with the culture, it's such a um, um, uh, completely um, well, complicated uh, dynamics that I, I would argue that it's not so easy to just empower mm. culture. Um, but, um, well, these are the two points that I wanted to make um, uh, well, in connection to your very inspiring and interesting presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, those are actually really, really good uh, questions. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer, I'm gonna answer both of them. Um, actually, push back, push back a little bit. Um, so from a very technical perspective, on your your first question, um, which is at the end of the day, these are all just vectors in in space. Um, that is true. The numbers themselves are just numbers floating in space. But how you arrive at those numbers is is where all of this uh, is is where all of these cultural biases and biases and other dimensions happen. A really good example of this is, um, you know, you mentioned the, the tokens that are under the hood of, of ChatGPT. So, uh, so if you use ChatGPT, or if you use uh, Meta's Llama, or if you use uh, Gemini, there is a part of the pipeline known as like the tokenizer. And this tokenizer is very good at tokenizing the English language, but if you pass to it something in Arabic, or if you pass to it something in Thai, or in a language that it's never seen, the tokenizer does not know what to do with that unseen word in Arabic, for example. And so the number that it will project it to in this vector space will be one that is just completely out of any learned distribution that it has. So um, to answer the, the, the first question is that yes, the numbers themselves, I, I completely agree, that those are like mathematically sound. Um, but the, the process at which we arrive to that, especially in this case, a tokenizer that recognizes English words, English vocabulary, um, or common words that are found on the internet, but specific words in Arabic, for example, are not tokenized correctly, um, will have a very strong effect on how that model operates. Um, so it's, it's a really good question. Thank you for letting me clarify that also. Um, the second question is actually, how do you empower culture and how do you know you're doing a good job? is a great question. It's one that keeps me up at night. Um, and the way, that I, the way that I like to think about this is that um, you share it with the world, 
and you see what people's responses are like. So uh, I think one of the very important parts about um, the, the work that I do and what I try to do is uh, I, I listen very carefully um, to how people within that culture and people outside of that culture respond musically or respond culturally or respond artistically um, to the work that I'm doing. And generally speaking, um, I, I really believe that culture is something that, uh, that sort of transcends also generations. So something is truly part of culture when a person that's like part of the older generation can appreciate and like it, but also like newer generations can like it. I think that it, I'm probably doing something wrong if like only older generation folks like it and like newer generation folks don't like it or newer generation folks like it, but older folks don't like it. Um, and what's been really exciting is um, seeing both the reaction, for example, uh, of my music from people of very, very different kind of backgrounds, both traditional musicians who, you know, teach me a lot of the things that I know about the, the music, being very excited about it, um, university grads in Thailand who listen to the music and are like, this is cool, like, I would totally dance to this if it like, came on Coachella or something like that. Um, all the way to, you know, in arenas like competitions where there are, you know, very global audiences listening to it and triangulating kind of the responses um, from all those experiences. Uh, and if the general gist is that, you know, I, I used the example yesterday of, uh, I really think music should taste good. Uh, it's like food. Um, I think if people think that the music tastes good, then I think I'm doing something right. And that's kind of like the, the, the internal compass that I have in terms of what does it mean to empower culture and how do we know if we're doing a good job uh, with it. Yeah. I think we have a question for one short question and then save it for the discussion and the break. Please. Oh, there was a gentleman over there. Who wanted to speak? No? No? That person. Thank you, Hanoi, for your very fascinating and thought provoking lecture. And uh, I want to ask, may I have your opinion on the, the little bit difficult question you posted in your slide at the end? Like, uh, what would it mean to like make empower cultural music that are like no one really wants to listen. Although I think your music is really fascinating, I will totally listen to it. Oh, yeah, Th thanks. Yes, okay, then I'm doing something right. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, uh, you know, your, your response is that I would absolutely listen to it is, is kind of like the main, I think like a very important part of the work that, that, that I do. Um, different, different, I think different artists and, and, and different organizations will have very, very different goals. And um, I think, I think for me, I think this, this part of uh, if no one wants to listen to it is, is a very important question because I think it brings it back, and this is now going less about the technology but more on like the music history and musicology side of things, and also the uh, how, how, how uh, what's it called? Um, uh, like the intersection between neuroscience and music is that music is made in the brain. Music is not something that is sort of inherent in this like the sound itself. Sound is just the vibrations, but it's actually our brains that, that create the music. And so I think this relationship that I have with listeners and their brains, you know, like making music in their minds is, is a very, very important relationship that I want to ensure is part of the process and it's not completely disconnected from, you know, all the technical embedding tokens and, and things like that. So yeah, I, I, I personally think it's very, very important. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. We have to move Thank on you. to the third speaker. Thank you so much.